Who killed Jesus? So with Resurrection Sunday having just passed, I was reminiscing on this uh, fascinating subject, but with that also came the reminder of how the SDA church once again finds themselves in a pickle. Here's why. In Genesis 22, we read about Abraham and the sacrifice of Isaac. Despite the many jabs that this story has received from the secular world, those with eyes to see and ears to hear understand that this is a picture for us that foreshadows the gospel, the person and work of Jesus Christ. We're told in verses 1 and 2 that God told Abraham to take his only son, whom he loved, and offer him up as a burnt offering on Mount Moriah. We are then told in verse 3 that Abraham obeyed God and took Isaac along with two of his hired hands with him to cut the wood for the sacrifice. Verse 4 tells us that after three days, Abraham could see the mountain from afar, so he told the young men to stay with the donkey while he and Isaac go and worship, but they would be back. Which is fascinating because if he was going to sacrifice Isaac, then why did he tell his hired men that they would both return? Scripture will answer this for us in a moment. But we're then told in verse 6 that Isaac was saddled with the wood that he then carried up the mountain. In verse 7, we see that along the way Isaac asked his father where the lamb was for the burnt offering, to which Abraham says in verse 8, God will provide for himself the lamb. Abraham then goes on to build an altar in verse 9, laying Isaac upon it. As he then proceeds to follow through with the sacrifice, the angel of the Lord stops him in verses 11 and 12 and says, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then in verse 13, Abraham then lifts up his eyes to see a ram with its head caught in a thicket or a thorn bush, which Abraham then substituted for Isaac and offered as a burnt offering to the Lord, which led to Abraham calling the mountain, the Lord will provide. So how many parallels to the gospel were you able to spot? The father taking his only son up the mountain, the only son carrying the wood that he would be sacrificed on, just as Jesus, the only begotten son of God, given by the father, carried the wooden cross up the mountain that he would be sacrificed on as the true antitypical burnt offering. We even see substitution also being worked into the picture by God who provided a substitutionary sacrifice, a ram with its head caught in a thorn bush. Jesus Christ being the better lamb that God did provide, who also bore a crown of thorns on his head. But it goes even deeper than that. We also saw in verse 4 that this all took place on the third day. God even shows us a picture of the resurrection here. And thankfully, he also decided to give us further insight into this in Hebrews chapter 11. Remember how I asked, why would Abraham tell his men that he and Isaac would be back if Abraham was planning on sacrificing him? Well, in Hebrews 11, 17 through 19, the author describes Abraham's faith and gives us an answer where he writes, By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, Through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. So did you catch that? Abraham's faith was tested, but God had already given Abraham the promise that all of the nations would be blessed through his seed, which means Abraham believed that promise from God and knew that if God was asking him to do this, he had a reason, and if necessary, he even had the power to raise Isaac back from the grave, which is why he trusted and obeyed, because God keeps his promises. However, verse 19 also ended by saying that even though Abraham knew this, Figuratively speaking, he had already accepted that Isaac was good as gone. Remember, this was told to Abraham before the third day. So in his mind, he had already accepted that Isaac was dead. But on the third day, Isaac was given back to him, just like Jesus' resurrection. But what we also see in this foreshadowing is that the sacrifice is committed by the Father. It is the Father Abraham that was pleased to do this work in accordance with God's will, which is exactly what the prophet Isaiah would later go on to tell us about God the Father. Isaiah 53 is a messianic prophecy regarding the Lord's suffering servant. It speaks of Jesus bearing the grief and sorrows of his people in verse 4, pierced and crushed for our sins in verse 5, and that the Father himself laid the sins of the people upon him in verse 6. But verse 10 specifically tells us that it was the will of God to crush him, put him to grief, and his soul make an offering for guilt. This is also in line with Acts 4, specifically verses 27 and 28, 
After Peter's sermon from the previous three chapters, the Christians were reported to the chief priests and elders, which leads to the Christians praying for boldness. In this prayer, Psalm 2, which is a messianic psalm, is cited in connection with the crucifixion. But in verses 27 and 28, we see that Jesus is referred to as God's holy servant and that God appointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and peoples of Israel, to do what God's hand and plan had predestined to take place, crucify the suffering servant. So God was the one behind the cross of Christ, not just in Christ who offered himself for us, but God the Father being pleased to crush his only son, using the heathen peoples as his tool and means by which to bring that about. It was God who put Christ forth as a propitiatory offering according to Romans 3. Scripture across the board makes this very clear. With this in mind, however, we see a different picture painted by the Seventh Adventist Church by way of their prophetess, one that the SDA Church is stuck with upholding. In the Desire of Ages, which Ellen White claimed is barricaded by a Thus Saith the Lord, specifically chapter 79 regarding the cross of Christ, we find a stanza on page 761 where she claimed to be shown what was taking place at the cross unseen to the mere human eye, a uh, peeking behind the curtain, if you will. Notice. She writes that, Satan saw that his disguise was torn away. His administration was laid open before the unfallen angels and before the heavenly universe. He had revealed himself as a murderer. By shedding the blood of the Son of God, he had uprooted himself from the sympathies of the heavenly beings. Henceforth, his work was restricted. Ah, so once again, we have Satan being inserted into somewhere he doesn't belong. In this case, he was the one behind the killing of Jesus. He made himself to be a murderer by shedding the blood of Christ, and it was because of this murderous act that his work moving forward was supposedly restricted. This was also supposedly what led to there being no more sympathy for him in heaven by the angels. Now, this is not to say that she is claiming Satan physically drove the nails into Jesus's limbs, but that the true agent behind the Roman soldiers was Satan, supposedly contrary to the plain biblical witness. We also see that she claims that her accompanying angel sent from God told her that it was even a struggle with the God of heaven whether to let guilty man perish or to give his beloved son to die for them. Which further showcases the warped narrative that Great Controversy Theology paints. God the Father held a council meeting to come up with a plan to redeem man. Jesus presents a plan that took three tries, pleading with the Father to accept. After accepting it, he then struggled to give up the Son to come and ransom fallen man, painting the picture that the Father agreed to let Satan murder Jesus and struggled with this. Which is precisely what we see toward the beginning of The Desire of Ages, where she writes that, Satan in heaven had hated Christ for his position in the courts of God. He hated him the more when he himself was dethroned. He hated him who pledged himself to redeem a race of sinners. Yet into the world where Satan claimed dominion, God permitted his son to come, a helpless babe subject to the weakness of humanity. He permitted him to meet life's peril in common with every human soul, to fight the battle as every child of humanity must fight it at the risk of failure and eternal loss. So what we see here is her reiterate something we've looked at numerous times, and that's this idea of Satan becoming jealous that Jesus was exalted to be made equal with the Father, which started this great controversy. After Satan tempts man, he becomes the ruler of this world, and Jesus is then reluctantly sent here by the Father, with there being the risk of eternal loss. All of this to say, this is a small insight into the drastically different story that drives the SDA Church's understanding of the biblical narrative. It is this backdrop that is found outside of the Bible that is then brought to the biblical text, which is read in light of this extra biblical backstory. God is not in a back and forth with the devil having to come up with responses to things done by his creatures that clearly caught him off guard, such that he had to enact a plan B that was arrived at by holding a heavenly council meeting, yada yada. Satan did not kill Jesus. God the Father did, and he was pleased to crush the Son by laying sin upon him. The triune God has chosen to glorify himself in this act by demonstrating his holiness, justice, mercy, grace, and love. But this would not be the first time that Ellen White attributed some of God's work to Satan. Just look at what they teach regarding the scapegoat. 